All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Sunny Mullen. I am the Outreach Manager here with Help Hope Live. And thank you for joining us today to be part of our Hope Talk series. This one is on celebrating family caregiver, which, you know, as we know, this year, probably more than any other year, is such an important and thankless job. So we have three amazing women that are here to speak about their experiences being a family caregiver to their husbands. Uh, we have Kristen Sachs, we have Katrina Golden, and we have Laura Sarche, who I am very proud and honored to say are all also Help Hope Live brand ambassadors. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kristen real quick to give a quick intro of herself, and then we will go on from there. So Kristen, would you like to introduce yourself and let us know you know, what, what actually ended up giving you the title of family, of family caregiver? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hi, my name is Kristen Sachs, and uh, my husband, uh, Jeff, uh, he was injured uh, diving into the ocean in 2013, so about seven years ago. And um, I, I always say, you know, in the instant that he was injured, um, that was when I became a caregiver. And um, I, I still, I had a lot to learn, of course, but... Um, I, I was always there by his side since we went through the injury literally together. I was at the beach when he was injured. So it was, we went through the whole thing together and um, it was just kind of a natural thing for us. Um, we did have some caregivers in the beginning uh, for about a year. I went back to work, but then uh, we decided that me being his primary caregiver, something we were both more comfortable with. And um, that's just how it's been from there. So we were seven years into this and, this is our life now. Absolutely, and Laura, how about you? Hi, I'm Laura Sarche. Um, my husband, Joshua, is a double lung transplant recipient. Um, his transplant was in April of this past year. So um, I've been a caregiver for him since we got married in March of 2019. He was starting to get sick a little bit before we got married and um, it was actually kind of what prompted us to start thinking about, um, you know, we were at the time thinking, do we want to get married? Do we, you know, I think this is the step we want to take. And um, at the same time, realizing he was getting sick and we didn't know um, at the time that it was interstitial lung disease. Um, and so, you know, we said, we want to do something that's difficult together rather than do something easy with someone else. So um, at that time, I took on the role of caregiver when we got married um, through his illness and then through his transplant and now following his transplant. Awesome. And Katrina? Um, hi, my name is Katrina Golden. And um, my husband and I both were involved in a four-wheeler accident. We both were on the four-wheeler back in 2015. And thank God I came out okay, but it left him as an incomplete quad. Um, high level quads, uh, cervical three through eight. So I have been his caregiver like the night I got out of the emergency room <laughs> until this point now, back in 2015. So it has been a process. Um, we've had other people to come in to, like you said, to do caregiver and to help out. But again, unfortunately, no one can actually do it like as far as his wife or myself can. And that's what we always um, understand that it's a certain way that he likes things and it's a certain way that things have to be done. But it is a process. Um, I'm still learning, got a lot to learn, still growing. And I'm just looking forward to this conversation. Absolutely, thank you ladies. And thank you Katrina for randomly wearing a teal top today. <laughs> we love it. Any, anytime you can be on brand with Help Hope Live, we are, we are there for it. Um, so with that, you know, you guys have talked about what makes you family caregivers, but within that and your lives, you know, we've talked about previously how there are so many other identities that you, you still identify with outside of being a family caregiver. So Kristen, what do you, what do you think as far as identities? How many other identities do you have that, you know, caregivers just one of them? Right, right. And I think that that is often one of the most challenging things about becoming a caregiver is because you don't stop being these other things in your life. Um, it's not like, you know, stopping one job and starting another job. Your caregiving is kind of piled. I, I call it an add on. It's piled right on top of everything you already are. You may be a spouse, a, a parent, an employee, a friend, a, you know, may have parents that you're, that you're dealing with. And, um, you know, there's, 
it's a lot to juggle. And I think uh, because caregiving can often show up unexpectedly and it takes high priority in your life. So you kind of have to juggle all the other things around. And, um, and it's very easy for caregivers to lose themselves in that process. And I think as a caregiver, I'm sure that many people have gone through that. And I know that I did. And because you're so busy trying to get your life back on track and make okay. sense of everything going on in your life. And you kind of tend to fall down on the priority list. So it's, you know, and, uh, you know, self-care, of course, is an important topic in, in finding yourself again and um, making sure that you're, as a, you as an individual, is a priority as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it is a really important part where you say that you easily could lose your identity. Mm -hmm. um, I find it interesting and, you know, a different perspective where, Laura, you came into this relationship knowing that caregiver was going to be one of your identities. How has that kind of affected, you know, you're still a sister and a teacher and everything else too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, that as we've kind of journeyed through illness and transplant and recovery from transplant, um, that caregiving has looked different um, through each of those pieces. And um, you know, my identity within that has kind of shifted as well. Um, when we were waiting for Josh's transplant and um, he was receiving the transplant and then immediately after the transplant, we had to relocate to another state for six mm -hmm. months. And so at that time, um, a lot of my other roles kind of disappeared. I wasn't a teacher for a little while and, you know, I didn't feel like I was really being a sister during that time either or, you know, and um, so that was full-time role was caregiving and, and um, an advocate at that time for Josh as he was in the hospital and, you know, I was staying nearby in a hotel and, um, and um, managing his care kind of remotely because it was also during COVID. And, um, you know, I think now that we've finally moved back home and we're still in the process of transplant recovery, which is a, a lifelong journey for a lung, a double lung transplant recipient. Um, you know, my part of my role as caregiver is that um, it's to help Josh regain some of his identities as well. So one of his um, identities is that he's a teacher as well. He's a music teacher and, and he's a brother and a son to a wonderful family. And, um, you know, so to help him be able to work again in a very different capacity than he did before the transplant um, is kind of part of my role. And um, that brings me a lot of joy to see him um, be able to find what he loves to do again in his, in his career and his teaching music and in his music. So. That's awesome. And I know Katrina, you've mentioned as well that you still, you see yourself as a wife first still. That's your main identity, right? Yes, it's always going to be the first. Um, when I get married, that's, when I was married, that's what I said. I'm my wife first. And then the caregiver came after the fact. <laughs> so, but trying to juggle being a wife, a caregiver, nurse, doctor, whatever, cook, you know, housekeeper, mm -hmm. all of those titles, and even more, as we all know, um, you have to prioritize which one is going to which one is going to be most important at the moment? Because at some moments, one is better, one is more important than the other. You know, you may have to be a nurse sometimes. You may have to be a stronger nurse where you have to kind of guide him and let him know this is what we're going to do. You know, I know it hurts, but this is going to help you. So sometimes you just have to take that dominant role um, other than what you're used to taking because as a as a caregiver and as a wife as most people most of us know it's a prioritizing the, the process understanding what's needed at that time and that's what has actually gotten us you know through the whole process although being a wife you want to be able to perform your wifely duties <laughs> as well as all the other things that you are required to do and unfortunately sometimes it goes lacking not mm -hmm. something that you did. It's just something that happens. You know, you want to be, you know, certain things you want to do, certain things you would like to do. But because of the situation that you're in, the stress levels that you're on, that you're on, mm -hmm. um, having to manage your time is some things get left out. Mm 
but you don't need to beat yourself up about it, which I had to teach myself that because I'm like, Lord, I want to do this. I need to be with my husband. I got to, you know, do these things. But it's so much stress on you and on your body and your mind because you're trying to think about how is it going to affect him? Is it going to hurt him? Is it going to do this? It's just so many things you have to think about as a caregiver. So that's what we are still going through at this point. Oh, absolutely. And I know, Laurie, you mentioned already about being an advocate for your husband. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned before that you found yourself really, that wasn't an unusual role for you. You've been a lifelong advocate. Yeah, so um, I grew up with um, a brother who had significant mental illnesses. And um, I myself um, am an autistic self-advocate and I have mental illnesses myself. So I've grown up being an advocate for um, my brother and for our family growing up and for myself, um, both with, with my family to help them understand my abilities and um, uniquenesses and then also in my workplace advocating for accommodations and things like that. Um, so starting to advocate for Josh's health was a very natural part of caregiving for me and, you know, and, and I think even, um, you know, as his wife, that was also very natural for me to kind of um, help with the advocacy piece too. And a lot of times, um, you know, it's been an interesting journey for us with that because a lot of times he would kind of want to be um, more independent with some of those things, but as his health declined and then after transplant, as it became, you know, now we just have, it's so much advocacy that has to happen. It's not possible for one, it wouldn't be possible for him to do that on his own. Um, so that's a role that I, the advocacy piece, I kind of happily took over and, um, you know, was able to be on the phone with doctors all the time and insurance and, um, you know, fundraising and um, donors and, um, you know, all different kinds of, and even kind of sometimes to Josh, I would be like, okay, I'm, you're take, I'm taking you to the emergency room right now. I'm calling your boss because you're in the middle of a faculty meeting. I'm calling your boss and telling them that you're just not going to be here for the rest of the week because you need to go to the hospital right now because you probably have an infection. And, you know, so just things like that kind of uh, seemed very natural for me to take on that piece of it. The medical part, on the other hand, as far as like physically taking care of Josh that I feel like I had to learn on the fly and you know it was kind of out of necessity he was in rehab after after transplant and they were you know saying hey he's going home tomorrow with you and um, you're gonna hook up an IV to his arm every six hours and and figure out how to change it and so I said okay show me how to do it and then I'll do it and you know same thing with managing his oxygen needs that was a huge huge piece of caregiving um, for the whole duration of his illness before transplant. And thankfully now he doesn't need to be on oxygen support at all after transplant. Um, but again, that was kind of the same thing before, before the transplant, um, you know, he would be short of breath and he couldn't, you know, even express what he needed. And I would have to be able to recognize those signs and be able to get to his oxygen machines and, and hook him up to those and be able to um, provide that support that way too. So. Yeah, and I know Kristen and Katrina, you both had said that you learned so much in rehab when your husbands were in rehab after the after the injuries that that kind of prepped you as much as it could prep you for bringing them home. Um, you know, as Laura said, all of a sudden you're hooking up IVs and, and medically taking care of your husbands. That's something you can't always be ready for. But, you know, you learned a lot in rehab. Yeah, and as far as with me, I learned at the before rehab. I mean, we were out of state on vacation when the accident occurred. So we was in a totally different state altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, we was in Florida coming back from an event, from a vacation. And then we had the accident in Georgia on our way home to North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And um, that night, uh, we, like I said, I went right from his hospital room, from my hospital bed to his hospital bed. And we were in the hospital there for two months. Then we transferred to North Carolina. So within that two months time frame, I learned a lot from seeing what was being done with the doctors and nurses, the staff, and how other people that had spinal cord injuries were coming in and how so many of them were left alone. It was so sad. And I was like, okay, this, this can't be real, you know, because they don't have anyone there with them at all, you know. So, and that's what I told my husband. I said, I'm, you know, your vows are for better, for worse. You know, you, you never know 
what may happen. So you have to be try to be prepared as much as you can. So during that time frame, it that's what that's what I hit. That's what helped us. You know, I'm watching everything, listening, making sure you know what the medicines are, asking questions mm -hmm. because he's not able to. You know, he's just laying in the bed and hoping somebody's going to be there for him, or you know, to give him the right information and provide the right service. So yeah, my caregiving started right after we had the accident, and then mm -hmm. from that point on up until now, we're still in the same process. How about you, Kristen? Yeah, I, I, I think I, I started to really get a good base knowledge uh, while Jeff was in rehab. He was in a, the original hospital for a couple months and it was, you know, it was all so new and I was really depending on the, the doctors and nurses for guidance because I had no clue what was, you know, going on and, and um, you know, you're still, you're in the process of, of trying to understand and get a grip on, on what your life is going to look like going forward. You're still in some denial as well, you know, I remember thinking, a nurse talking to me about going to a rehab facility and I was like what are you talking about my husband's gonna be fine <laughs> like in, in a few days he's gonna feel better we're gonna leave this place you know but of course that's not what happened and once we got to the rehab facility that specialized with people uh, who have spinal cord injuries that it really opened up a whole different world for me I started to get more hands-on training um, and you know be trained on some really important things. Uh, my husband is ventilator dependent and um, I had to learn how to, I mean, like Laura was talking about with, when you're dealing with oxygen and, or, or, or ventilation, I mean, this is, this is life or death. You have to be able to be confident in, in your ability to, con, you know, work these machines. And I mean, at first I was so scared. And, and of course now, seven years later, it's, it, it's not nearly as frightening as, as it used to be, but um, you know, it's part of the, the learning process. And um, you know, my, my husband has no arm movement. So I, I literally am his hands as well. And, you know, I think in there, we kind of developed a good teamwork uh, together because there are things that, you know, I literally have to do for him to be his hands and, and to be his voice as well, like we're talking about with advocating. And yeah, and I think, I mean, one point with that, though, uh, that we've talked about in the past is that, you know, you are, you're all such amazing advocates for your husbands, but sometimes caregivers aren't really great advocates for themselves. Because exactly, as you're all shaking your heads right now. And I mean, not to cross any boundaries here or there, but I know that some of you have had some issues recently where you probably should have spoken up for yourselves a little sooner or left and right. And that's just, I think that comes along with what Kristen said with the whole identity issue, though, is you just are constantly put to the back and you're here loudly advocating for your loved one. And yet all of your needs just aren't even being thought of. I think That's true. Definition as as a being a caregiver, you're providing care. You're taking care of everybody else and everything else, and it's just so easy for yourself to slip down there. And I know that I've done that bef before as well. And I think we we talked about it last time when we were we were talking that um, you know it's it's difficult for me sometimes to even schedule a doctor's appointment. But it's so important. It's a, you know you have to get out and make sure that you're healthy in order to take care of everybody else. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, but it's, it's so easy for that to, to slip by. And, you know, I see that a lot with, with, with caregivers, like in caregiver support groups, and it's a very common thing. Um, right. but it's important to, to try and every once in a while, you got to pick yourself up and put yourself as a priority. <laughs> it's hard too. It is hard. It is very I know. hard. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I know, Katrina, you had said that Stephanie tells you sometimes to be sure to take care of yourself, but you know, yes. he just, it's a lot easier said than done. It mm -hmm. is. And he tell he has, he's told me this from the beginning, you know, he said, you got to try to, you know, take care of yourself. Um, make sure that you make your doctor's appointments. He, he will always tell me that, but it's like, okay, I try to do it, but at the same time, yours is more priority. You know, it's like yours is more important at the time than mine. But now <laughs> I'm realizing because of the surgeries that I'm, I have to take, you know, I have to have that he, he was right. Um, in, in the most part of it, he was right. The bitter pill to swallow sometimes. Yeah, right? it is. <laughs> it's really bad. It is. It truly is. Yeah. But with me having to do the different surgeries that I have to do now, um, I wish I had to listen. I wish I had to pay more attention to me in the beginning than I did because it could have may have prevented some of the things that I'm going through now physically. 
mm-hmm. but it's, it's hard to do. It's, it's not saying it is easy. It's definitely not an easy process um, to try to just go to your doctor's appointments and do the things that you need to do for yourself at the same time, manage his medical needs or her medical needs, you know, their medical needs. It's, it's a long process. Um, but, you know, like I said, we, we learn and it's a caregiver. Like, like Kristen said, we care for everybody else other than ourselves. It's just that simple. I know Laura, I saw you shaking your head a little bit there too. I'm not putting you on the spot. You don't have to share anything, but even just the fact of taking care of yourself in general, it's just such an important thing. And I know too many family caregivers in my life that I try to shove this, for lack of better words, down their throats. And it really, it never sticks though. And so yeah. it's, it's, it's hard. Sonny's laughing at me because we met about a month and a half, a month yeah. ago or so. And, um, you know, to kind of have a pre-meeting just to talk about what we were going to talk about at this hope talk and um a couple days before that i had fallen down the stairs and um it was in a lot of pain and um so finally the day after this meeting i went to the doctor and got an x-ray and i had a broken tailbone and so i called up sunny and i was like oh you'll never believe what is what happened no. she goes you i can't believe you were at our meeting yesterday i was talking never about caregiving not to talking care about yourself. caregiving <laughs> anything <laughs> about it <laughs> and i hadn't even gotten myself to the doctor yet so yeah. you know my husband is an amazing, amazing advocate for me as well. Um, so he, it was just interesting being in the position to have him take me to the doctor and him, you know, telling me, you know, it's okay that you have to take a couple of weeks off of work. And, um, you know, and he is great because he'll give me specific suggestions. Like now that I'm, you know, feeling better after my, in, my small injury, um, you know, he'll be like, you know what, you should, you should do something you like today. You should bake <laughs> cookies and, you, you know, do, you know, go shopping or, you know, do this. And uh, so, you know, call up the, you know, somebody from the family and visit. And, you know, so, um, so I'm really grateful that, you know, he, while I'm caring for him, he is one of my biggest supporters. You know, he is my biggest supporter of making sure that I'm doing self care and, mm-hmm. Um, you know, so it's a really, you know, I know we've talked about, um, you know, the three of us have talked about before, Katrina and Kristen, how like this shapes, you know, this role of caregiving and, you know, having a family member within, with an injury or post transplant, it really shapes our marriages. And, you know, I think for me and Josh, it brings us closer and we, um, you know, navigating this together, it just is, that's what we do. And, you know, so it's, and that's, it's a good thing. So. That's great. And I know, I mean, yeah, to go off of that, the, how has this maybe Katrina and Kristen strengthened or changed your relationships with your husbands? Well, for me, it has strengthened it because it does allow us to communicate more. Um, now, I will admit the intimacy part is a little different <laughs> because, you know, we, you know, we want to be more and I'm sure he wants to more than I do because my emotional side <laughs> um, is not there like it needs to be because I'm so, my mind is so on him and his care that I put that aside for myself. But overall, our relationship has actually gotten better. Um, we are more attentive to each other. We listen to each other and just being able to be there without, you know, knowing that we can handle this situation. And because it's a different situation for us, it's a worse situation than we never thought we had experienced um, to see how our marriage has, has strengthened from there. You know, it's, it's a good, it's really, a, that part is a good thing. Absolutely. And I, I know that um, my relationship with my husband has certainly strengthened and, and deepened through all of this. And I, I had mentioned before in our, in our talk that it's almost like we know one another on a different level, almost like a different dimension that maybe wouldn't have existed in our previous relationship if, 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 if this hadn't happened. And I think, I think that we have discovered a deep respect for one another. And um, 
the one great thing about my husband and going through this is even though the injury happened to him, he understands that it doesn't affect just him. He sees how much it affects me and our daughter and then are, you know, kind of out from, from there, like family members and friends and stuff. But he, he sees that, you know, we are both in a very challenging situation. And um, I, I kind of describe us as we are on opposite sides of the same coin because we are bound together by this injury, me being his caregiver. He's the one facing the injury. I don't know what it's like to be paralyzed. But at the same time, he understands he doesn't know what it's like to take care of somebody who's paralyzed. And because of that, we have a really deep bond and, and understand that, you know, we're both very challenged by, by the, the change that has happened in our life. And it's definitely made us very, 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 very close. I think that's so important, just the fact that you said that Jeff acknowledges that it's not just him. It's the family, right. it's the friends, it's, you know, the inner bubble is Jeff, and then it kind of ripples out from there, and that ripple right. effect of, it truly does affect everyone in your lives when someone has a catastrophic event, like a transplant, yeah. like, an, like an injury. Mm-hmm. Um, and for that, that acknowledgement's important, though, because it's, it affects the way that you communicate and, and all of that. And so Absolutely. even just to, to bring it back a little bit to what we were talking about, and Laura mentioned self-care, I know, you know, one of the biggest things that we were, we were just talking about it, the fact that you hear it every time when we go on an airplane, which clearly isn't this year, um, put on your <laughs> oxygen masks first. Caregivers need to take care of themselves as we were taking, as we were talking about before. And so what do you even do outside of, you know, mental health maybe, but is there anything fun that you guys do for yourselves or what do you do for yourselves to kind of find yourself again, find that identity you may have lost? Any of you, go ahead. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I know. Well, I know, Kristen, you had mentioned that sometimes it does, you know, obviously it doesn't need to be a big event. It can right. be 10 to 15 minutes out of your day that you maybe Absolutely. just go sit with a good cup of coffee. Self-care can be, and I've, I've talked about this too, because I'm, I'm, I'm my husband's full-time caregiver and I'm his only caregiver. So, you know, I don't get a lot of breaks, but um I think you need to learn to do self-care, even if it's like in the snippets of time that you have. Um, mm-hmm. I've, I, I, I write a blog about our, our life and I've had people comment on there about how, um, you know, I should get away. Uh, uh, you know, every, every caregiver is rolling their eyes right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, we would all love to get yeah. away and have a vacation, right? I've had somebody, you know, say that you should go to a hotel for like a weekend alone. And I'm like, that would be great. I'm sure I'd sleep the whole time, which I would absolutely need. But that's completely unrealistic for me. That's, I just can't be away from my husband. His care is too complex to have somebody just step in and, and start taking care of him. There's things people have to be trained on. Um, but I can get away for a couple hours sometimes. Um, his parents are trained on the ventilator, so they, can, they often will come over. And like my daughter and I will go out to lunch together or go, go shopping. I mean, it hasn't happened too much this year because of COVID, but, um, but there's other ways too. I mean, literally just taking a bath and I, I will set it up. I will make sure my husband is good and be like, I'm going to take a bath. I'm going to be gone for 20 minutes and, you know, I'm going to set you up and hopefully he won't need anything in that time. There's been times that he has, but most of the time I'm able to get some time to myself. And, and even in that short period of time, it can be very refreshing. And I would say too, and I mean, an interesting thing you bring up about people saying, just go take a vacation. How is it though, I mean, how do you deal with that aspect of people just truly not understanding? And that can even be your closest family and friends that honestly oh, just yeah. don't understand that you can't easily just go out for the day. Um, it's just, that's something that, you know, it's such a dichotomy between what people perceive your life to be and what is actually happening within your household. Yeah, and that's, that's true. And then with me, um, just taking that extra, like you said, taking that extra time. Now, I've been blessed and lucky enough to have a chance to get away for a weekend, but it worked because my husband's daughter, she's a CNA. So Mm -hmm. she actually came here for one week um, and took care of him totally while I went away for a cruise with my support group, my caregiver ladies support group, which was such a blessing. Um, That don't happen often, of course, because like you said, you, when your family members don't, if they're not around you, they don't see what you're doing. 
a lot of times the family members don't come around because they don't know how to address the situation or how to talk about what's going on or even try to care for the person. So whenever you say you can't go to these places or you can't do these things because you can't leave him home by himself, they don't understand why. And it's like, well, he's, he's just sitting at the computer or he's doing this or he's doing that. But it's more to it than that. He can't get up by himself. He can't, you know, move by himself. He has to have someone there if he has to go to the bathroom or whatever the case may be. So I think a lot of it is because your family and friends are not around whenever the accident has occurred because they don't know how to deal with it. So they don't come around. And then when it's time for you to try to get a break, you're not able to get that break because they don't understand that you really need it you know, that 10, 15 minutes just to sit and read a book, you know, or 30 minutes just to get away or meditate or whatever that you do to try to release some stress is, is, is actually something that you need as a caregiver. But mm -hmm. like I said, family don't, they, they're not around a lot of times, so you don't see it. Laura, how about, how about you guys? I know transplant's a, a bit different of a journey and you've mentioned how it, it's a, a roller coaster, really, because you, yeah. you, get diagnosed and then you're on the pre-list and then you're, so there's a lot of different steps that go with it. Yeah. And, and it just seems like all of it happens very quickly and, you know, and, um, and then post-transplant, you know, a lot of times like you would look at Josh and he's able to do things that are, you know, he put up our Christmas tree last week, you know, he was able to bring the box up from the basement and put it all up in, you know, the living room. And so some, some weeks he's able to do that. And then, but he's also, after transplant, you're extremely vulnerable to any kind of illness or disease or, um, you know, so he could get an infection and it would completely, you know, he'd be in the hospital for a week or two. And, you know, that's happened to us too. So, um, you know, I think similarly to Katrina, I think the hard part is that, I, you know, caregiving is such a big role and, and I feel like a lot of the people who see me with other identities don't always know what that big of role is, you know? Um, like, for example, I, I'm, you know, I'm still working and um, I'm a teacher, as I mentioned before. And um, a lot of my coworkers, like, you know, they, oh, how's Josh doing? But they really have no idea that, you know, we're, you know, trying to manage appointments all the time. And, you know, there's a lot of talking to the insurance and, you know, just being extremely careful with, um, you know, managing his health. And our family is very understanding about, um, we have to be extra precautious. Everybody's precautious right now because of COVID. And, um, you know, we have to be even that much more precautious about visiting people or just how, you know, any kind of exposure to COVID or any disease would be really difficult. And, um, so I think that, um, you know, the role is, um, it's, it's hard to kind of explain to someone who has not experienced it. And then, um, you know, I think that the um, self-care piece is, like Kristen and Chris Katrina both said, is Sometimes it is just that 15 minutes, like you have to remind yourself to do something that you enjoy for a couple minutes every day. And, you know, I think as far as, you know, people saying, oh, just go, you know, do X, Y, Z. And I think as a caregiver, that's not a lot of the times the things that people might suggest are not things that I would find very rejuvenating. I feel like, you know, like Kristen said, I might just want to take a nap for a couple days or, or, um, you know, I would want to take a, you know, part of my wish is like Josh and I could take a vacation together when I wouldn't have to worry about him getting sick or I wouldn't have to worry like, oh, is he going to be in a lot of pain today? And, you know, just um, because those are some things you know, in caregiving, there's so much that we try to control. We try to, you know, control our husband's physical health with as much of the things that we can do. And there's a lot that we can do, but then there also is, you know, so much that we can't control. And that's, that's really difficult. And, you know, that's kind of the part that, you know, I wish that we could, um, you know, do something like that together without having to worry about those pieces. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You're always, there's, there's never, you know, you become the ultimate problem solver because you never quite 
are sure if it's going to be 100%. And you might always be waiting for the floor to fall out from underneath you. Um, and I mean, with all of that said, too, what kind of support do you guys seek out? I know, you know, Katrina mentioned her ladies that she's really close with, her support group. And maybe you're, you've got church or family. Um, what kind of support do you guys seek out so that you can maybe help in this, in, in this every day with, with your husbands? Yeah, so with me, I'm, I'm part of a Facebook support group called Wives and Girlfriends of Spinal Cord Survivors. I love my ladies. They're so wonderful. I love them, too. Um, <laughs> I'm in the same group, and it, they're, they're, they're incredible. It's incredible. They're awesome. I mean, you can, I mean, ask anything. You can relate to the situations. They can feel comfortable by sharing or venting. Sometimes you just got to vent. You just got to get it out. You know, and we're we're on that group to listen. Um, that's one of my support groups. My church is another. Um, I'm very involved in the in our church ministry, so that is another. You know, plus my spiritual level that helps me um, in regards to the support that I need, because I know that you know, like I said, all things are working out for my good, even though it doesn't seem mm -hmm. like it sometimes. <laughs> but they are. That's that truly are. Um, but those areas is what I you know find my support from when I need to to the mental break, you know, and to relax. Um, but there's, a, like we said before, other things that we do um, to gain support is trying to find resources. And I'm sure we'll talk about that later. But I'm gonna let go ahead and let Kristen talk and Laura. <laughs> yeah, well, and in that too, like, how do you then manage asking for help? And I, I bring that up because I know, Kristen, you brought up a great point when we spoke earlier about giving people specific items when you're yeah. when they're asking for help. And if you could touch on that again. Absolutely. And um, asking for help can be a very, very difficult thing for a caregiver to do because, you know, you kind of see your job as, as, as do, being the one to, to handle everything. And sometimes it, it just gets overwhelming and you have to ask for help. And I've learned that um, I, what I, I don't ask for help with my husband's care because that does require training and education that, and often people are not comfortable learning something like that other than like his, his parents, you know, making sure how to an under, like understand emergent situations. Um, but I do ask for help from his parents with things they already know how to do. And I think that that's, that's been really helpful for me and even to ask some, some friends or other family members to, you know, people already know how to shop. People already know how to cook dinner. Uh, you know, like people can do those things for you without it seeming like you're asking them to do too much without making them feel uncomfortable. And they often feel it's a, it's a way for them to, to really provide, you know, assistance for you. Um, and right now, um, Jeff's parents, they live up the street from us and they make dinner for us two nights a week. And it is so incredibly helpful. And we just sent them a list of like 10 things that we like and they just, they surprise us. They don't even, like I told them, I'm like, I, I want to be out of this. Like on yeah. those days, I don't even want to think about dinner and it's so helpful. His dad will text me and be like, we're having beef stew tonight. Oh, perfect. Yes. You know? And it shows up at my door and it's, it's so incredibly helpful two nights a week. And it's, you know, asking people to do things that they already know how to do that would help with your life. You know, sometimes my mother-in-law will come and help me clean the house or clean an area of the house. My dad will come over and um, help with our daughter's education. We're doing homeschool this year and he takes over some of the math stuff. He was an engineer and he loves it. She loves it. It's a win-win situation for everybody. So that's a way that I found that you can ask people for help that really is very beneficial, kind of on both ends. Yeah. How about you, Laura? What are, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think part of it is, you know, kind of comes back to that, like the level of understanding people have about what is truly going on in your caregiving role and in, you know, in our house with, and, um, you know, I've, today, like, I feel like pretty good about things, right? And I know the day that we talked, to, you know, I was not, I was feeling really overwhelmed. And a lot of days that I do feel just so overwhelmed with, you know, caregiving and advocacy and phone calls and appointments. It's a and, lot. It's a lot. And, and it's that, okay to feel like that. Yeah. So I wanted, I wanted to throw that out there for any other caregivers that are here that it is okay to feel overwhelmed. And I feel like very unqualified to be giving this 
talk and, you know, and Sonny and is so gracious to say, you know what, that that's what everybody needs to hear. And so I think Carrie, that, well, as we, as we mentioned before, Carrie even meets everyone at a different point in their life. Yeah. And so, you know, mm-hmm. all three of you are at different points in your caregiving, but no one's prepared to be a family mm-hmm. caregiver. Right. So, no. so this, you meet it where, where you're meant to be met and take it from there. Yeah. So some supports I think that are extremely helpful are both Josh's family and my family. And, and I think one of the things that is most helpful is that they understand that it is overwhelming and that sometimes, you know, I'm just not going to be able to talk on the phone or, you know, I just need grace to say, okay, you're going to bed at seven o'clock and getting 12 hours of sleep tonight. And, and I'm not going to judge that. And, you know, and, um, or to come, like Kristen said, and come to clean one of the rooms in the house or, you know, just, it seems like, you know, there's all these things that are parts of caregiving. And then we also have to take care of the house. We also have to make sure we have food to eat. And we also have to try to hold down a job. And, um, you know, all of those things is, um, you know, we need support. And so I am extremely grateful for our family support and, um, our church support too. And, um, and I think, you know, one thing that I will ask for help for sometimes is, um, when Josh is in the hospital and, you know, it happens because post-transplant, you're going to be in the hospital sometimes. Um, I'll ask somebody to just come and sit with me and they have no expectations. And that is just wonderful. I know that I can call up one of his sisters or, Um, one of either of our parents or, you know, any of our family and they will just come and sit and be with me, maybe share a cup of coffee, maybe just talk. If I don't want to talk, they're okay with that too. And that is one of the um, biggest things because in those moments when things are out of our control, if he's in the hospital at that point, I, I'm his voice and advocate, but I am not, you know, as many times as I saw somebody in the chat say something about thinking people were nurses. And that has definitely happened to us when Josh was in the hospital and I would come visit. People would be like, oh, is your wife a nurse? And, (laughs) you know, so I'm sure that's happened to Katrina and Kristen as well as we have, you know, managed this role. But um, when that's out of your control, when he is, it, you know, has an infection in the hospital or post-surgery or whatever, that sometimes you just need to have some company. And that's something that I'm really grateful for. Absolutely. And I know, Katrina, you mentioned earlier, and it is a really important part, point about finding resources for your husband. How did you go about mm-hmm. doing that? Yes, that is very important because as much as, you know, we want family to be supportive and to be there, unfortunately, a lot of times that's not the case. Um, so you do have to try to find other avenues. So um, I would suggest, and what I've done is looked into my local area first for like this, no, with my husband, he's a spinal cord patient. So I'm looking for the North Carolina Spinal Cord Association, um, finding out those resources, finding out about the Christopher Reeves Foundation um, that has a lot of resources for people with spinal cord injuries and disabilities, um, because you're going to need more than just, you know, um, you're going to need more durable medical equipment that unfortunately the insurance won't pay for. So mm-hmm. you're going to need to find resources, grants, uh, foundations that will help cover some of these costs. And there are a lot of them out there. You know, uh, if you haven't went to there, Christopher Reeves Foundation has a lot of lists for you. You pretty much, you pretty much just put in what you're looking for and they'll send you um, information in regards to how you can, you know, contact these places but the 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 most important part is that you have to be able to contact them don't be intimidated don't be afraid don't be you know be bold enough to say you need this you need this you need modifications Mm -hmm. you need doable medical equipment you need to you know get things ready for the house Um, for us we were able to receive just so you'll know that it works (laughs) Mm -hmm. um my husband and I were able to receive a stair lift, a curved stair lift, which is a, uh, what, $10,000 project. Um, we were able to get two grants to cover that. We had to get a, a real hospital bed, an electrical, electric, fully electric hospital bed from Hillrom. We were able to get that covered through a foundation. And there's things that I'm still working on that we need done, but it's like taking the time, and I know we don't have a lot of time, but when you can find some, 
just fill out a short application. It's not long and detailed. Um, and or just pick up the phone and call them. Let them know your situation. But there are resources out there for us um, if we just take the time to look. Or, like you said, I'm part of my support group. I posted it for my ladies so that way they can just go there and click. You know, all I gotta do is click on the link that we sent, the page, the PDF, and see what see what works for you. Absolutely. And, you know, I wouldn't be the outreach manager without a shameless plug of Help Help Lives resource directories that are on our website as well. So it's, they're so important. And there's so, so much out there, though, that it's overwhelming. So it is, it is always helpful when you have other people in the community to talk to and share those resources that are tried and true. Um, so somehow we are already almost at an hour. So I want to, we do have a few questions that have come in. So I want to be sure to get to them. Um, we have one question that asks, with the acknowledgement of how your loved one's disability affects the wider family, how do you manage any guilt of maybe your loved one has guilt of being injured or maybe Laura, maybe Josh has some of taking so much of your time away? How does guilt play into your relationships? Well, for me, my husband does sometimes feel that way because for one, he was driving a four-wheeler that we were on. And in the background, I'm telling him to slow down. (laughs) So he didn't slow down and then we had the accident. So to this day, he still feels some of that. But I always tell him, you know, you can't change what has happened. An accident can happen at any time. So uh, you have to realize that things do happen in your life and the guilt portion of it will pass. You know, you just can't blame yourself for what has happened because most of the time it's not your fault. I know that um, for my husband, guilt plays a a very big part in his life Um, post-injury. He was injured diving into the ocean, just running in from the shore. And a lot of this happens to a lot of people. and I mean, it was entirely his fault. Of course, he didn't mean to injure himself, but um, you know, he, he will often say, and it's, it, it affects him really the most when he talks about parenting our daughter. Our daughter was four years old at the time. And now, I mean, I always remind him how great of a daddy is. He has an incredible relationship with our daughter, but it'll never be the relationship that he imagined in his life because he can't, he can't even hug her anymore. And that's a very, very difficult thing for him. And, you know, and he sometimes just has to sit there and I just have to let him cry about it and get it out. And that's part of, of being a caregiver is just being there to support it and to say, it's okay to, to feel this way and, you know, not let him stay there but um just let him have that the those moments um of you know saying this isn't exactly how i wanted to be a a dad this is not exactly how i wanted my life to be but also reminding him of all that he's accomplished with our daughter and and reminding him also that our daughter doesn't necessarily because she was so young when it happened she doesn't necessarily have the same view I, he's just dad. He's just the way that he is. You know, I don't, I don't think she really sees it as, oh, I, I wish I could be doing these things with my dad. I mean, maybe a, a little bit, but I, I don't, she doesn't really express that as I wish our life was different. And I wish dad was different. Dad's just who he is. And, and they, they have a great relationship together and have found other ways to connect uh, other than like, like physically playing or something like that. I think for Josh that um, it's helpful for um us to remember that you know it is different like our life is different because he had a transplant and just kind of stating that instead of you know trying to fit it into the mold that it might have been if you know he didn't have a lung disease and hadn't had a transplant and so now we look at okay well here is here's where we are and here's what we have and where are we going with that and just kind of trying to take a fresh look at, um, you know, the blessings that we have now and um, to kind of look forward to, um, look forward to little things sometimes. And, you know, we have definitely had lots of conversations about changing some of the things that we, you know, dreamed about or wanted to do um, at various times. We've talked about, you know, I, I don't know if those are still dreams that we have now kind of thing. And, um, but there's also other things that we, you know, we can't, you kind of like in a hopeful way, you sort of 
redefine your purpose and um, you sort of allow, allow the um, circumstances of the moment that you're given um, to say, well, here's what we're going to do with that. This is, you know, there's nothing we can do to change about what has happened. And so we're here together and we're going to, you know, and it's not even like a make the best of it, but just make something new out of it. And, um, you know, so I think that's something that is really helpful for, um, for managing a lot of those emotions that come with, come with being someone who needs care and, and being a caregiver too. Absolutely. And I mean, it's such a powerful emotion. I think it's like you've all said, to allow yourselves, your family, and your loved one to own up to those emotions and have those honest emotions is really important. Um, you know, on kind of on a little bit of a different note, but re very relevant this year, this year has been very different for everyone. Um, everyone has different levels of how they're taking care of themselves, but you three obviously find yourselves in maybe a heightened state. How has COVID really affected, I mean, Laura, obviously you're smiling, you've already kind of talked about it because transplant patients are just so susceptible to infection after transplant. And this year you were slammed with the international pandemic. And so how has COVID changed your caregiving styles or what you've needed to do or any of that? Well, for me, it's actually, um hasn't really changed as much, to be honest, because we always were at home anyway. Um, we don't really go anywhere. If we go to the store, we're ordering delivery. So we have been doing a lot of that before because I don't drive. And my husband was my primary care, primary driver before the accident. So after the accident, you know, everything had to be on me decide, trying to figure out how we're going to get certain things to the house. Um, we don't really have a lot of company here, um, which is good. <laughs> um, those that do come, they, you know, I try to get them to make sure they have the mask on if they do come. Um, you know, it's, it's like he's home anyway, so it's just keeping the people from coming into the house. And when we have to go out um, to the doctor's appointments, I make sure that he has his mask on, make sure that, you know, we got all this sanitizers, the, the spray, Lysol spray, all this stuff that we need in his backpack. So we're pretty much covered in regards to that. Yeah, I, I, in a way it's been similar for us as, as Katrina and her husband. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time at home anyway. So that like the, the staying home aspect hasn't changed much for us, but um, you know, we, we have avoided so far having to go to the hospital, but there are times, you know, when in the past, especially last year, uh, Jeff was hospitalized several times and he had a, a, some stomach issues and, you know, being on a ventilator, he is susceptible to pneumonia, which he's had many times. And sometimes we can't handle it at home and we have to go to the hospital. We don't have a choice and we haven't had to face that yet, but we have certainly talked about it and how fearful you know, that would be, I mean, he's already on a ventilator to begin with when you go in and there's hospitals are overrun with COVID patients. I mean, it's very frightening what, what could happen. And not only that, but I've heard uh, other people who have, whose spouses have gone to the hospital and, you know, hospitals aren't letting caregivers come in. And that is a huge fear of ours because I absolutely have to be with my husband. Um, when he goes in for an issue into the hospital, the hospital will treat that issue, but they won't provide somebody who's going to be, you know, managing his care while he's there. Um, you know, and that's a that's a huge issue for us, and and it is a big fear for us. Um, you know, so we're we're really trying to be very careful to make sure he doesn't contract anything or or you know have to go to the hospital. And it's not like you can easily download his history because I'm sure you have binders oh, yeah. of his medical history. Oh, yeah. So it's it's not like you can just easily update a nurse right away with what his needs right. are. And there's not there's nobody like we've talked to we talked about a little bit in the beginning of this. I mean, I'm gonna be super honest. There's nobody who can take care of my husband like me. There is there's That's they okay. just you just can't. And I know everything about him. And I've I even talked to some nurses about that before. I'm like, look, I'm not trying to say I can take care of anybody else in this hospital, but I do know how to take care of my husband. And I've had to advocate for that because as a family caregiver, you can do things to your, you know, with your spouse that medical professionals can't do. The same person who changes his catheter is not going to also change his trach, but I can. <laughs> and I need you, we need to have me in there with him 
and to literally sometimes be his voice and you know or how he's who's going to push the call button my husband can't move his arms i mean it's a very it's a it's, it's a big concern um of you know the um caregivers not being allowed in hospitals right now i know that some uh, I, i've heard that some are but i don't know about our, lo our local hospitals so it is a big fear or how about you guys? I know obviously this this year is just a big scary pandemic for and like we said, transplants are just so susceptible. So how have you guys yeah. been dealing with it? So um, Josh was um, getting to the point where he was needing his transplant as soon as possible um, right before the pandemic started. So in February, he was on uh, you know, 60 liters of oxygen in the hospital and, um, you know, waiting for a transplant. We were also, I was advocating a lot for balancing. He has um, some autoimmune issues as well um, that he needed to be on prednisone before the transplant. And so I was spending a lot of time advocating, no, no, don't treat him with prednisone because we can't have him on prednisone before the transplant. <laughs> and even though they wanted to, you know, treat his lungs with prednisone. And so I would have to advocate, like Kristen said, sometimes, you know, based on his history, the immediate care that the doctors would provide is not the same immediate care that um, your husband needs. And Absolutely. so, um, but then the pandemic started and in March, they, I was not allowed to visit the hospital anymore. And so I had to do all of my care and advocacy remotely. And I would wow. try to talk to Josh through the nurses on the phone um, because he was on a ventilator and couldn't talk. And, mm -hmm. you know, so the nurse would either, um, you know, talk to me and then let him do some sign language. And then she would try to describe the symbols and I would translate for her over the phone or she would hold up the phone to his ear and I would talk to him wow. so that he could hear my voice. And, you know, and I spent a lot of hours on the phone with his uh, medical team. And, um, and then I was um, still not, I was able to get into the hospital the night before his transplant and see him one time before the transplant. And then um, I waited at the hotel for the, you know, updates from the doctor throughout the surgery and, and after the transplant for about two months, I was still not able to see him. Um, and finally, when, you know, he was talking again and- And that's uh, all because of COVID, right? And that's all that because of COVID, not because of his transplant. That yeah. was just because the COVID or the COVID pandemic happened at the same time as his transplant. We also faced a lot of issues with him getting a donor because of COVID. So um, because of COVID, there were not as many transplants happening and not as many donors getting accepted because if there was any chance that a donor had COVID, they would not take organs from that person. And they didn't want to send doctors into hotspot cities to go harvest organs from potential donors. Okay. So we ended up having to take a, take, um, a, a double lung set from a donor whose roommate was positive for COVID because it was the only option. And his doctor said, you know, we would never do this. We would never give these lungs to someone if there was a chance that they were exposed to COVID. But you have to take these lungs because there's no other chance Josh can't wait any longer. Oh so we had to, you know, make that decision. And thankfully, miraculously, the lungs have been awesome for Josh. He's breathing fantastic after the transplant, but it was a much more complex journey through the transplant. Because you had to make that decision separate too, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 I had to make that over the phone with the doctor while Josh was in the room on a ventilator. Um, yes. So, you know, it just is, it was a much more stressful journey because of COVID and, and then just so difficult being apart for, you know, many months while he was at the hospital and I couldn't visit. And, um, you know, and that made it, you know, when I was just starting to take over his care, when he was released from the hospital, I was also reacclimating myself to him because we'd been away from each other for four months. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, you know. You had a new roommate. <laughs> had a, I was like, oh yeah, you again. Like, that's very weird. <laughs> so, um, you know, and then we are, um, we don't have anyone in the house. Like Katrina said, we 
Um, you know, don't have visitors in our house now that we're back home. We have to be extremely careful because um, it would it would not be not be good if Josh were to contract COVID or or even the flu. And right. um, you know, so we have to be pretty isolated during flu season, and then and obviously during COVID. I think in some ways COVID is a a, a little bit helpful because people actually understand about masks now. So we would have to be wearing masks and be isolated during the flu season, regardless of COVID, because mm -hmm. of Josh's double lung transplant, um, to some extent at least. Um, and, and because of his double lung transplant and his polymyositis, his autoimmune disorder. But since there's COVID, now everybody knows that they have to wear masks and you know they know a little bit more about um, viral transmission and lung, lung disease. And you know they know how dangerous ventilators, you know, they know how dangerous diseases are and the effects that, you know, they know how hard it is to have mm -hmm. someone be on a ventilator because they've, you know, seen it's in the news all the time. I think a lot of people didn't even know what a ventilator was before COVID. And now, you know, obviously the three of us are very familiar with them, but um, you know, it just, it adds a little bit of awareness for people that I don't know if we would have had without COVID. Yeah, oh, definitely. And probably an awareness you would be very happy to have been without, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it is, I mean, it is interesting. And I know, Katrina, you bring up a point that we've heard a lot within the community that maybe it hasn't changed our lives too much. Not changed your lives, but it's not very much different from your everyday life for mm -hmm. individuals in the disability community, especially those that are a little more complex that Maybe and and to some effect, it's maybe brought the playing field a little a little more even in the fact that people are experiencing mask wearing or are experiencing being home every day and all of this. And so it's a it brings in a much different conversation to the whole community, which has been interesting. But you know, we have reached over an hour at this point. I knew this was gonna happen. We could probably sit here and talk all day long. I appreciate you ladies so, so much. I just wanna one last check-in. If any of you have just a last word of advice or a piece about being a caregiver or what it means to you, you know, we're talking to a community right now that has either had someone take care of them or is a caregiver themselves. If there's just one thing that you could leave with them, a perspective, that would, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I think you have to learn to laugh. I think you have to find the funny moments in the very serious moments. Um, and I'll just share a, a brief story about we were um, in the hospital a couple months ago, Josh had an infection and um, he needed his gallbladder removed, completely unrelated to transplant, but um, you know, more dangerous because of it. So they didn't know where to put him in the hospital because he's a lung trans, he had had a lung transplant. So they put him in the heart floor because you know, <laughs> heart, lungs kind of you know, yeah. related. So this nurse comes in and she takes his vitals and she listens to his, listens to him and she gets this funny look on her face and she calls over her supervisor. Supervisor goes, oh honey, we're on the heart floor. His heart works. That's what it's supposed to sound like. <laughs> and Josh and I laughed so hard yeah. because we were like, oh, he's got one organ that's working great. Yeah. You, know? <laughs> so yeah. you just have to laugh. You have to yeah. find the funny moments. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. How about absolutely. Katrina? How about you? Is there any lasting piece of advice or just something you've learned along the way? You're you're on mute, unfortunately. <laughs> Sorry. You're okay. You're okay. <laughs> so what I would definitely say is um, affirm yourself as much as you possibly can. Um, as a caregiver, we're not always going to get everything right. Um, you may not change his catheter right. You may not do certain things like you thought you could do. Um, but just affirm who you are, you know, you're, you're a caregiver, but yet you're a woman, you're, you're able to do, constantly affirm yourself, because a lot of times you're not going to get that confirmation or affirmation um, from other people, um, mm -hmm. because they don't understand your situation. So take that time to really, some, like I said, you talk to yourself, you're not crazy, you're just trying to, you know, let yourself know that you are, you are okay. You know, you're going to go through these, these challenges, but at the end of the day, you're okay. Krista? I, yeah, I, I, I second that, um, you know, both things, what both Laura and Katrina have said with the, the, the humor, finding, finding humor, finding ways to laugh and to like, you know, it, it does wonders for your bodies, for your mind, for your soul, um, you know, finding, finding the, the funny. Um, and it, I think it helps, it definitely helped, you know, kind of bring back 
um, pieces of ourselves, you know, once we started finding humor and, um, you know, it, it, it really helped us in, in, our, in our journey going forward. And as a caregiver, I think it's important um, to have confidence in yourself. And, you know, I, I, I really think that caregivers, like Katrina was saying, sometimes we second guess ourselves. We're doing so much. We're doing things we never, ever expected to be doing. But caregivers are incredible. They are, I think, the best troubleshooters on this earth. I, I, I remember somebody- And multitaskers. Yeah, yes. in, in one of my groups yeah. saying that if she ever started a business, she would hire caregivers because we figure things out. You know, yeah. if there's not a solution, we have to find one. We just, yeah. just yeah. Do and, and, um, and do that with confidence. And, you know, I think to, to help build yourself up, when, especially in, in times that when you can be low, that if you're a caregiver, you're awesome. That is probably the best way we could end this. Absolutely. If you're a caregiver, you're awesome. 100%. The three of you are awesome. I just really thank you for your open and honest and beautiful words today. And this community has really enjoyed listening to you. I know that firsthand from the comments I've been seeing come in. And hopefully, you know, we can form more of a supportive community here at Help Hope Live as brand ambassadors, as a larger community. We're just so happy to have heard your experiences and to share in those experiences. So thank you guys again. Thank you ladies again. And please to remember everyone that tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern on Help Hope Live's Facebook page, we will be raffling off the Grubhub gift card so that we can, as Help Hope Live, be taking care of you a little bit. So please tune in tomorrow at 12 p.m. You'll see my face again and we'll pick out someone's name. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you for listening. And thank you. Just have a Thank great day you. and remember that you're awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.